This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Juan Gonzalez. Welcome to all of our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. Climate change is a top agenda item as leaders of the seven wealthy de democracies known as the Group of Seven, or G7, wrap up a two-day meeting in Germany today. Heads of state from Britain, Canada, France, Germany, Italy, and the United States are holding talks in a secluded resort housed in a hundred-year-old castle. Outside the summit, protesters have been met by a massive show of police force with as many as 20,000 officers deployed for crowd control. Thousands of demonstrators took to the streets Saturday in the nearby town of Garmisch to oppose other issues under discussion, including the Trans-Pacific Partnership Trade Deal, or TPP, and austerity measures. This is Stop G7 spokesperson Benjamin Russ. It's totally over the top, and one has to see that the way we've been walking in the streets and have organized ourselves well, the camp was well organized. This massive police presence is totally over the top. On Sunday, leaders and reporters had to be shuttled to the G7 talks by helicopter after protesters blocked the main road. Today, the summit host, German Chancellor Angela Merkel of Germany, is seeking endorsement of goals to limit the increase in global temperatures and to provide financing to countries dealing with the impact of climate change. Talks are expanding today with the addition of several African leaders and Iraqi Prime Minister Haider al-Abadi, who is set to meet with President Obama. Meanwhile, a $10.4 billion bailout package for Greece has been a central focus among the country's creditors attending the summit, including heads of the European Union, European Central Bank and the International Monetary Fund. Greek Prime Minister Alexis Tsipras is in attendance. Neither is is not in attendance. Neither is Russian President Vladimir Putin, as leaders agreed to continue sanctions against Russia over its aggression in Ukraine. Well, for more, we're joined by three guests. Joining us from Garmisch, Germany, near the G7 summit, is Gawain Kripke, the director of policy and research at Oxfam. They've just published a new report called Let Them Eat Coal, which notes the G7 countries remain major consumers of coal, which is the biggest driver of climate change and world hunger. In Washington, D.C., Eric Lecomte is with us, executive director of Jubilee USA. He was recently in Dresden, Germany, for the G7 finance minister's gathering. And here in New York, Nomi Prinz, former managing director at Bear Stearns and Goldman Sachs, and previously an analyst at Lehman Brothers and Chase Manhattan Bank, now a distinguished senior fellow at Demos. She's also the author of All the President's Bankers, The Hidden Alliances That Drive American Power. Last week, Nomi Prinz was invited to address global central bank leaders at the Federal Reserve and IMF's annual conference. We welcome you all to Democracy Now! Let's go first to Garmisch, to Bavaria, to Gawain Kripke. Can you talk about the massive protest that's going on outside? met by an even larger police presence, uh, believed to be the largest police operation in Bavarian history. Why people are protesting the G7 summit, Gawain? Well, it's a very uh, energetic protest. It started in Munich uh, a few days ago and then has moved up here to the mountains. And uh, it's a vi wide diversity of uh, complaints that the protesters have against the G7. I would say the biggest one that I observed was a real concern about the free trade agreement that is being negotiated between Europe and the United States, with a concern among the protesters that it'll be pushing lower standards for uh, things like energy efficiency and food safety onto European markets. Markets. So a real resistance to that trade agreement from the protesters, but also protesters uh, concerned about climate change, about global poverty, uh, and, a, and a range of other issues. And on the issue of global poverty, what are some of the concerns that uh, you feel from Oxfam will, are not being addressed by the summit? Well, the G7 have always sort of fashioned themselves as the board of directors for uh, global development and the global economy. And so we always look to them to make new commitments and, and, and statements about ending poverty and reducing hunger. Uh, we're hoping for something ambitious from the G7 leaders. This is a very important year for global poverty and also for climate change, with very big conferences scheduled for later this year. And the G7 can really uh, put a lot of energy into those efforts if they make some commitments here. We're looking for them to say something about how these richest and most developed countries 
agencies will take actions to reduce their climate change, uh, to provide funding for less developed countries to also develop in a clean way, and also to end hunger, which is going to be one of the big goals that is going to come out of the UN later this year, uh, in which uh, the world is going to try to end hunger by 2030. Going, can you describe the scene for us there? Um, your uh, the G7 meeting in this hundred-year-old castle, and the massive police presence outside, along with thousands of protesters. Right. Well, it's very beautiful, for one thing. It's a, it's a, a great location that the Germans picked for the G7. The castle is quite remote, and we can't even see it from where we are. Most of the protesters and, and the nonprofits and most of the media are actually located some distance from the castle. So we see it on TV, but we don't, we're not really observing it. The protesters are in the streets. They have an encampment a few miles away uh, that is, I'm told, very orderly. There's been some big rainstorms, so I think it's a bit muddy. Uh, but uh, the protesters have been going around the streets in a very uh, uh, festive way and, and laying out their concerns. The police presence, uh, what I've seen, is pretty restrained, uh, but massive and, and looks very highly mil militarized. They, uh, they're marching down the streets in columns looking like soldiers. Uh, but I haven't seen a lot of uh, rioting or, or excessive abuse myself. I'd like to ask Nomi Prince, so one of the big issues is going to be, obviously, uh, debt uh, and what to do about Greece and, in general, the restructuring of the, the banking system of the world following the 2008 crisis. I'm wondering, uh, you've spoken to the uh, IMF recently. What is the main message you're, you're trying to send uh, to the, those who are dealing with financial uh, reform? Well, one of the things I talked about in, in Washington last week to, to the Fed and IMF and the central banks, um, bankers around the world, is that there is a continued instability, um, which some of them know and some of them refuse to admit, in the financial system throughout the world. And that has had a knock-on effect on global economies everywhere. There was a decision made by central banks, by private banks and governments together at the highest levels of, of, these, of these countries to help the banking system at the expense of the people system, the real economy, to invoke austerity measures in order to pay bondholders, and that continues to be in place. So when you talk about the situation in Greece, what Greece is basically saying and has been saying for a long time is that, look, are the austerity measures you pressed upon us are irrational, are impossible um, to use relative to the fact that our economy has slowed down and our debt, the, the uh, strings attached to the bailout that we received in order to pay bondholders, in order to pay uh, the IMF and central banks and so forth, are, are impossible to pay. But yet, they continue to facilitate stability for the financial system and the major banks around the world. So they're getting the money. They're getting the benefit. People and the countries outside of that upper echelon are simply getting hurt. You have written about <clears throat> Clinton cash. Can you explain what that means and what it actually has to do with what we're talking about today, uh, what it has to do with the G7, what it has to do with banking in the United States and multinational banking? Yeah, well, Clinton Cash is a book that came out recently by Peter Schweitzer, where he looks at some of the Clinton Foundation associations with countries. Um, and I go further into examining what their associations are with the major banks in these countries, particularly from the United States. And if you follow a two-decade through line from well, when bin, Bill Clinton became president through Hillary Clinton now trying to become president, you see that the relationships along the way with Bank of America, with Citigroup, with Goldman Sachs, and so forth, whether through appointed positions, whether whether through money along the side, whether through pushing their policies of deregulation and benefit to the banks at the expense of the rest of the population, they continue to go through. So in the beginning, we had deregulation coming in through the Clinton administration. We had the Glass-Steagall Act being repealed, which meant these bigger banks could become bigger and consolidate people's deposits with all of these risky derivatives and other types of transactions, which then imploded the financial system. In the wake of the financial crisis, that still exists. Relative to the rest of the world, a the biggest six banks in the United States are bigger than they were before the crisis. They've received more help from Obama's government, which has a lot of people in it from the Clinton administration, from a Treasury perspective, um, and they continue to thrive at the expense of the real economy. In addition, the foundation, the Clinton Foundation, has received from 250000 to $5 million donations from the same largest institutions, among others, that continue to push their agenda throughout the United States as well as throughout the world. But do you think that real structural change has occurred since? I mean, because we, we, we still get uh, uh, inf uh, 
information or news about the LIBOR exchange uh, uh, c conspiracy, the currency manipulation. Uh, we see continued crime after crime in the financial world, and doesn't seem to be any real structural change occurring. No, absolutely. That was one of the things that I, that I said in Washington. You basically, and also the Big Six Bank of the United States, they're hoarding cash. So, so the result of these zero interest rate policies throughout the world emanating from the Fed in the United States and this quantitative easing or buying bonds back from all these banks, giving them more money, is a 400 percent more cash after the crisis than they had before, not going into the real economy. And they're committing crimes. The big six banks in the United States have paid fines or settled to pay fines for 120 to 130 billion dollars. LIBOR rigging, FX rigging, mortgage fraud, money laundering. It goes on and on. So we just saw the U.S. Attorney General, um, Loretta Lynch, with this big announcement about FIFA, right, the, uh, the whole soccer scandal. Person after person in the leadership of FIFA have now been indicted. Um, right before that um, was the allegations about banking fraud. Uh, now, we're not talking person after person. In fact, we're not talking anyone. We're talking about institutions, banks. Can you address this as a person who worked at um, many of these banks, from Lehman to Goldman Sachs? You know, first of all, the FIFA thing as a scandal is, is such a a, a, a non-event relative to the fact that we had just recently that $5.6 billion fine on FX rigging. That means rigging the currencies. These five banks, including J.P. Morgan, Citigroup from the United States, uh, UBS and Barclays, um, they, they, they got together and, and rigged what people pay for goods back and forth. They, they, they engendered harm uh, to the global economy. They got a $5.6 billion fine compared to a $150 million fine, nowhere in the same vicinity, um, for people at FIFA heads rolled. No heads rolled. Jamie Dimon got a $20 million increase in his compensation voted upon by his shareholders right before that FX rigging fine came out. And what would it mean? I mean, you lived within this culture. Why aren't people indicted? Why aren't people sent to jail? And what would it mean for what happens inside these banks if they were? I think it would make big, big difference if the heads of these banks, and I, you know, I mentioned if some of the CEOs would actually be, be sent to jail, be held accountable in any personal way whatsoever at all. Instead, they've been able to point fingers inside their institution. Oh, that trader did it. Oh, that was sort of a bad department. That was a bad Apple approach. And, and they continue, Jamie Dimon and Lloyd Blankfein, they continue to run these companies. And globally, again, these banks have committed more crime and been settling for more crimes than anywhere else in the world. It would make a difference. It, it would send a message that says you can't do that. But not only have they not been sent to jail, not only have they not had any personal um, indictments or convictions, they also continue to get upholded by their shareholders here, which actually isn't something. In Europe, they've kicked out some bankers along the way and CEOs along the way by shareholders. I'd like to bring in uh, Eric LeCompte of Jubilee uh, USA Network. Uh, the issue of coal, uh, we have heard over the weekend of the Norway Sovereign Wealth Fund deciding to divest uh, in coal, coal investments. Could you talk about the G7? nation's role in, in, issue of, in the issue of coal? Well, I think, you know, the, the whole entire role of the G7, uh, as they describe it themselves, uh, is to focus on, on global uh, economic growth. And when we're looking at these particular issues uh, around divestment, I think we also see a lot of connections between what Naomi was just describing in terms of how the global banking system is operating, uh, as well as what Gawain described as some of the chief concerns from protesters on the ground being TTIP, uh, these trade agreements, as well as uh, an overall uh, negligence to uh, really addressing global poverty issues. You know, right now, when we look at Greece, when we look at the developing world, when we look at the International Monetary Fund, the European Central Bank, and others wanting to promote a higher degree of austerity in Greece uh, in order for them to receive more bailout funds, we have to understand that fundamentally uh, we're dealing with a, a problem of global instability. And in fact, when the G7 financial ministers uh, met last week in Dresden, uh, when I was in Dresden, uh, the chief focus, how the table was actually set for this G7 summit, the financial ministers focused on the issues of high debt and being able to achieve growth in what is now considered by the G7 and the International Monetary Fund to be unsustainable debt, unsustainable debt that will prevent economic growth. And I think as we're looking at the Greek situation, we're looking at the
these broader issues of divestment, I think we need to see some real shifts in terms of how the global financial system operates. And I think one of the issues um, that was very interesting um, that's now um, been uh, at the table at the United Nations with three general assembly, uh, three general assembly votes in favor of a global bankruptcy process. They're working on a process. The International Monetary Fund for the last two years has been working on a process. Last week in Dresden, we saw all of the major religious leaders, the Catholic bishops, the Protestant bishops, call on the G7 to end poverty by bringing stability, by erecting a global global bankruptcy process to end poverty. And in fact, at the prayer service last week in Dresden, we saw German finance minister Schobel attend because we know these issues uh, are so key right now. We do need to see some solutions if we're going to have greater stability in the markets and the global financial system. But in terms of this whole I issue of, uh, uh, of, of, the, of a global bankruptcy uh, regime, what about the issue of the ability of so many corporations to hide their wealth and profits in, uh, in, uh, in tax-sheltering countries? Well, and, and this is a, this is an incredible concern. We have to understand that debt and tax are, are flip sides of the same coin. You know, two years ago at the the, the Lawrence Summit, we saw the G7 take some historic action. Um, they called on uh, broad ways to curb corporate tax avoidance, to be able to stop these anonymous shell corporations, which uh, around the world are, are hiding these funds. And, and although we've seen some action, much of it has just been talk so far. Uh, I think at this particular summit. Um, we've also heard that they're reviewing these issues. This last summer uh, here in Washington, President Obama and the White House hosted uh, a very important Africa summit. And one of the main drives that came out of that summit is the curbing of corporate tax avoidance, evasion and corruption, because right now the developing world is losing a trillion dollars a year to these illicit financial flows, to tax evasion, to corruption. And we're looking at the question of Greece right now. We have to say that these issues are, are very much connected. You know, certainly more austerity plans for Greece are, are not going to work. They, they can't be part of the recipe. And there needs to be some real debt relief, like we saw in 1953, ironically, with Germany, when Germany uh, had what in Germans call the Wirtschaft Wunder, the economic miracle. And that was a direct result of the 1953 London Accord, where all of the lenders, all of the creditors were brought together to London. London. Not only was Germany given debt relief, but more importantly, Germany was given what the Greeks are asking for right now. And that's not even necessarily debt relief. It's to be able to extend those payments further in the future so that money can be invested in the people now. And that also deals with this tax issue, Juan, that you're, you're bringing up, because we have to understand that in Greece there are issues in terms of corruption and tax evasion, that although the government has done a better job at collecting these monies, they need to also improve this in the future so they can get out of the debt trap. We're going to break in a minute, uh, and we're going to stick with Eric Lecompte and Gawain Kripke, who is in Bavaria right now. But, Nomi, your final comment as you leave for what's most important for people to assess what comes out of this G7 summit. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I, I totally was nodding to everything Eric was saying. There, there has to be a, a, a moving over of supporting the global financial system at the bank level to supporting the global real economy at the foundation level, the people up level, whether that's debt relief, uh, bringing in taxes so they're not off shelter, deleveraging the banking system, making it more transparent, cutting up the banks, making them responsible because they've gotten all this help to the real economies. All of that has to be part of the play. Otherwise, this continues, and it just continues to hurt the economy's least able um, and least getting all of the help from the top. Nomi Prince, thanks for being with us. Former banker, author of All the President's Bankers, The Hidden Alliance that drive American power. We'll go back to Bavaria uh, to speak with um, our guests. Uh, we'll be speaking with Gwen Kripke as, uh, of Oxfam America about the issue of coal and Eric Lecompte with us in Washington, D.C. Stay with us.